Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the uh, session, the solid earth and structure session. Uh, my name is Durcan Meral Özel, uh, International Monitoring System Division Director. Today, I'm going to moderate uh, this important session. And the session focuses on the scientific and technical advances in monitoring the earth's interior, the lustre structure, the dynamic behavior of the earth, and some also uh, some static properties of the earth. And we are very keenly focused on wave propagation, particularly the uh, region of wave propagation. And today we have six excellent talks in the session from velocity structure, mostly uh, the velocity structure. And also there is talks on tomography, uh, depth determination using telecystic wave and also uh, dynamic rapture simulations. And I would like to uh, introduce the first speaker uh, and its team, uh, Shuichi Kodaira from Japan, Eichiro Araki, Takanehori, Go Fujie, and Ayako Nakanishi. The name of title of the presentation, Monitoring Subsea Floor Deformation in Plate Subduction Zone. Thank you very much. Uh, can I start? Yes. Yes, uh, I'm going to share my screen. Just a moment. So do you see my uh, slide? Hello. So can you uh, see my slide? Hmm. Uh, excuse me. Uh, okay, thanks very much. So uh, I, uh, I'm gonna start. And uh, thank you for giving this opportunity to to present uh, our uh, project of the monitoring of CFRO, uh, sub CFRO deformation in plate or subduction zone. So today I am going to focus on uh, the our project we are doing in the Nankai Trough uh, in the southwestern part of Japan, uh, where uh, we estimated that probability of the magnitude 8 cross earthquake in the next 30 years uh, is more than uh, 80%. And uh, the Nankai Trough, which is the uh, south east, uh, western part of Japanese island, uh, the Philippine Sea Plate is subducting beneath our uh, Japanese island. And uh, in this uh, subduction seismogenic zone, the history and rupture zone of the mega first earthquake uh, is uh, very much uh, well studied. Uh, for example, in the diagram here, so we see the uh, when the mag uh, magnitude eight cross earthquake occurred, uh, and where is the rupture zone of these earthquake, and uh, we can uh, uh, we have the record of large earthquake. Uh, based on the historical literature in the last uh, 1400 years, and also the paleoseismological data, including geological uh, data, can be traced uh, back to 4000 years ago uh, to know the history of this earthquake. Uh, but uh, uh, looking at this diagram closely, the earthquake interval uh, fluctuated between 90 to 260 years. Uh, and also in each cycle, either a pair of earthquakes occurred or a single earthquake ruptured in, uh, in the entire region. So the uh, repeating uh, the earthquake interval and rupture zone uh, distribution is very much complicated. Uh, it's not uh, equal interval for or earthquake. So these uh, those uh, 
uh, diversity make it difficult to estimate the future earthquake based on uh, only historical data. And also, in the last uh, 10 years or so, uh, the, in the subduction zone, the very important phenomena uh, has been observed that it's a slow slip event. So the slow slip event is kind of slow movement of the plate boundary fault. But the, a, this event it shows very complicated uh, characteristic time scale. So characteristic time scale of interval of duration of slow slip event uh, varied from the 100 years scale to uh, 10 second uh, scale. So, uh, in order to capture uh, this wide spectrum slow slip, uh, I mean slip, be slip behavior along the plate boundary, the, uh, we need uh, a real time continuous or uh, geodetic monitoring. So, in the Nankai 12, uh, the Japan Coast Guard, they established, they uh, developed very important seafloor uh, geodetic network using so-called uh, GNS, uh, GNS uh, acoustic link uh, geodetic measurement. In this method, method uh, approach, they deploy the uh, seafloor acoustic station and uh, they send the ship uh, above the uh, acoustic seafloor station. And the position of the ship is determined by a GPS signal. And then they measure the uh, distance from ship to the uh, seafloor acoustic station using uh, our, so our uh, 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 sound sonic velocity. So uh, using this method, uh, they can estimate, uh, they can draw the image of the plate coupling. For example, in the red region uh, shows the strong coupling and the yellow region shows the uh, weak coupling. So this is very much in uh, important geodetic seafloor geodetic technique to know the plate coupling, uh, but uh, the import uh, the one uh, problem of this method is they need a ship, so 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 they send a ship for example uh, every uh, two or three months. So uh, they for example uh, in this uh, diagram uh, the red and blue indicates the data they observed. So this means they uh, observed uh, the uh, geodetic data three, four times in a year. So uh, this time scale is uh, much, much longer than the uh, duration of the slow slip event. So temporal resolution is not as high as to detect the slow slip event. So in order to detect the uh, plate boundary slow slip event, the other time continuous geodetic monitoring are, are necessary. So uh, in GEMSTEC, uh, uh, toward understanding uh, slip uh, behavior and its temporal variation, uh, we have been constructing a geodetic uh, network using uh, DUNET cable system. I will not uh, talk about the DUNET system it itself, but uh, DUNET is the cable connect connected seismometer and uh, pressure gauge uh, network uh, for the RE warning and tsunami and earthquake. Uh, but uh, uh, in this project, uh, we use uh, this uh, system to transmit the geodetic data in real time. And to construct a secret geodetic network, uh, we have been installing a borehole uh, observatory of to uh, um, to observe the uh, uh, strain or or pressure and so on or tilt, uh, and also the uh, we uh, have been calibrating all uh, DUNET uh, pressure sensor, which is a tsunami or sensor, to utilize them as a geodetic sensor to monitor the vertical deformation, and also uh, recently uh, we. Uh, are working very hard to develop the fiber optics uh, sensor uh, to get the geodetic data and to connect uh, DUNET system.
Okay, so the, this is a very nice example to show the, how the uh, borehole geodetic sensor uh, can detect a slow slip event. See, uh, we uh, Jamstack deployed uh, one to three uh, borehole uh, observatory, uh, which has the seismometer, uh, power pressure gauge, and the strain meter and tilt meter. And we have one, two, and uh, three station uh, in the Nankai trough, and all station, borehole station, uh, is connected to DUNET to get the geodetic data uh, in real time. And uh, the diagram uh, in here shows the two months uh, variation of pore pressure, uh, which is equivalent to volumetric strain observed uh, blue station and red station. And uh, in this uh, diagram, you can see the kind of stable uh, uh, signal of pore pressure then. Uh, you see the transient decrease and transient uh, increase of pore pressure uh, within the two weeks uh, time window. And uh, similar uh, phenomena observed in different time, uh, we have the about a two week time window of decrease and uh, increase, uh, then decrease of pore pressure uh, observed in uh, borehole station in subduction zone. So using this, uh, those data, we can estimate the plate or slip uh, behavior. So uh, the, uh, we are using this data, we estimate it about one to two centimeters uh, plate boundary slip within two uh, weeks. So, so this is the very clear signal of slow slip event uh, occurred in the plate boundary and observed by a borehole station. And uh, looking back, all observed data uh, back to the, uh, about 10 years, uh, we found that the slow sleep event occurred uh, every uh, year or one and a half year. And also, uh, we estimated that uh, those events to release are 30 to 55% of strain uh, due to uh, plate subduction. So this is very good example of how the seafloor geodetic uh, method is important to detect uh, our slow sleep event and subduction zone. And another approach, another geodetic approach to establish geodetic monitoring is to utilize DUNET uh, tsunami gauge as a geodetic sensor. So the, as some of you may know that uh, pressure gauge has uh, instrumentation drift so uh, which is kind of problem to use the uh, pressure gauge as vertical geodetic sensor. So to solve this problem, uh, we developed a mobile pressure calibrator to carry, uh, carry out in search calibration of uh, DUNET pressure sensor uh, to estimate the drift rate of each uh, DUNET tsunami sensor. And uh, now we are working on to uh, calibrate our DUNET uh, tsunami sensor, and uh, the, we successfully uh, calibrate the pressure uh, sensor using a mobile pressure uh, calibrator, which is carried down uh, to seafloor using our, our ROV, and uh, we calibrated pressure sensor of uh, uh, DUNET station within resolution of less than one uh, hectopascal and uh, we estimated the drift component is 2.2 hectopascal hect per six months. So now we are do, uh, calibrating all uh, uh, DUNET pressure uh, sensors. So once we're gonna uh, complete this calibration, we can use DUNET tsunami sensor as a geodetic sensor to monitor vertical motion displacement of seafloor. And uh, the uh, recently uh, we have the, uh, we have been working very hard to establish new, new technology of geodetic uh, monitoring using fiber uh, optic technology. The, the, we are doing three approach. One is a uh, uh, borehole optical uh, tilt meter, uh, deploy the uh, shallow borehole. And also uh, we are constructing fiber optic strain our sensor. And also we are now testing uh, 
a dance system distributed acoustic sensing to monitor the earthquake and also hydroacoustic signal. So uh, uh, we are testing those uh, systems and so far we observed a very uh, high quality uh, earthquake signal and also long term uh, strain change and also uh, we uh, confirmed that that system can observe the hydroacoustic signal from ergon and also micro earthquake. Okay, uh, but to, the important point is realistic 3D or seismogenic zone model is a very much key to transform seafloor and subseafloor deformation to the plate boundary strip. So in order to obtain the 3D or realistic uh, our uh, structure, the, uh, we Jamstack have acquired uh, many 2D uh, line of active source seismic study uh, data in the Nanka trough uh, at every about 30 kilometer spacing. And uh, by interpolating uh, those data, we constructed a 3D model of subduction zone, overall 3D model of subduction zone uh, in this area. But uh, the characteristic uh, scale or variation we can resolve is about 30 kilometer space uh, uh, wavelengths, uh, which is not enough to uh, 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 to examine the uh, relation between structure and slow slip event uh, whose uh, spatial characteristic spatial size wavelengths is less than 20 or 10 kilometers. So that means we need a more uh, high resolution realistic or 3D geometry of subduction rate boundary to utilize geodetic data, uh, to fully utilize geodetic data. So uh, what we have been doing is uh, large scale 3D imaging uh, and high resolution OBS imaging in the entire Nankai subduction zone to construct 3D multiscale. Multiscale means P and S and density uh, model uh, in the Nankai trough subduction zone. So in the uh, last couple of years, uh, uh, we acquired this dense uh, active source seismic data in Nankai trough. And uh, last year, we have more data in the eastern part of this area. And using this, uh, those data, we can uh, successfully uh, image a detailed image of the, of the uh, plate boundary fault uh, in this area. So in this map, uh, we uh, observed kind of uh, rich structure in the plate boundary from here to here, and we observed the deepening of the plate boundary fault uh, in the uh, central part of Nankai Trough. So we continue to acquire those data to map to uh, map the uh, entire um, plate boundary fault in the Nankai trough. And also uh, we need to develop the uh, new modeling approach to fully utilize the geodetic data. Uh, so far, uh, most of modeling approach uh, used uh, uh, use a homogeneous half space median to estimate plate uh, strip from seafloor displacement. So uh, in order to uh, fully utilize the seafloor geodetic data and 3D model, uh, we need to develop the modeling technique to implement 3D in, uh, in homogeneous and viscoelastic elastic median with fine mesh, fine, uh, uh, finite element method. Uh, we, our team is now developing uh, this method uh, also. Okay, so this is uh, my uh, last slide. Uh, in order to understand the strip behavior and its temporal variation, evolution in subduction seismic zone, we are doing monitoring and imaging and modeling uh, by constructing a, a real-time uh, geodetic data and 3D modeling and a highly soft sophisticated uh, modeling procedure. Uh, I think this uh, research approach and technological development can be applied to uh, observe and character, characterize of dynamic process uh, in the Earth, uh, including uh, man-made process uh, such as a nuclear uh, test or something like that. Okay, 
I, uh, this is everything what I would like to present today. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kodaira. Uh, it was really interesting talk and it was very nice uh, monitoring system, observation system, and also good research. And I would like to ask if any questions. I would like to ask myself, uh, Kodaira san, if possible. Yes. Uh, before uh, we were only just checking the depth of the earthquake to draw the geometry of the, the subduction plate and the plate boundaries. But now I have seen that you have been converting many of the equipment even to check the uh, uh, use the uh, like a vertical geodetic sensor. And also you have been constructing the interpolation 2D to 3D seismic zone model. You have many different observation and different research. Then it means that uh, if you compare the depth distribution of the event and the other research and the uh, other observation and other data, then uh, can you compare uh, which one can draw properly the geometry of the subduction zone yeah. or the boundaries? Uh, oh, thank you very much. Thank you for asking. The, for example, the uh, the uh, the earthquake uh, epicenter depths determined by uh, only land station uh, is much deeper than those determined by seafloor network using realistic time, uh, realistic uh, structure. For example, the seaward side of Key Peninsula, the uh, we have large high uh, seismic activity. And the land station determines if center depth is uh, nearly 30 kilometer. But uh, if you use the uh, DUNET data and also realistic uh, 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 subduction zone structure, the uh, if center depth is uh, become much uh, smaller, close to the plate boundary. So I think uh, several network and also realistic uh, structure is very, very important to determine the depth correctly. Highly improved. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, Kodaira. thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you. Yes. I would like to introduce second. The next speaker is Nada El Tahir, and the, the title of the presentation Velocity Structure of the Uppermost Mantle Beneath the Tanzanian Platon and the Surrounding Proterozoic Mobile Beds from PN Tomography. We would like to invite the presenter if connected. Others now show up, then we have to wait for next presentation.
Okay. The next presentation about crustal structure, a crustal P-wave velocity model for Israel to improve IMS capabilities in the Middle East. The presenter Luis Shadon, Stefan Mers, Michael Bagnard, Yael Ratzener, Alon Hilal Bustlok, Brian Young, Yohai Ben Hori. Hi everyone. My name is Luis and I'm a seismologist at Tel Aviv University. Today, I'm going to talk about an ongoing collaboration between the Israeli and American nuclear safety administrations. Our main goal in this project is to get a better picture of the crustal structure below Israel in order to reduce event location uncertainties and thus to improve the CTBTO's seismic monitoring capabilities in the Middle East. So I'll start my presentation by overviewing the current limitations of the Israeli event catalog, as well as some of the challenges posed by the lack of tectonic features. I'll then present the Israeli seismic bulletin and the work we did to revise it. Next, I'll show some preliminary results using two different seismic tomography approaches. And I'll finish by giving some conclusions and outlooks. In a recent study where they relocated the entire seismic catalog of Israel for the past 30 years, Batzler and Kurzan reported large event location uncertainties. One of the reasons for that is the lack of consensus on a local velocity model. In this table, they list much larger location errors with the model currently in use than with, than with other local or global models. Moreover, the many upgrades that the Israeli seismic network went through also made it more difficult to keep track of some of the station metadata. And more generally, the distribution of sources and receivers in the area makes it more difficult to have a homogeneous coverage, considering that the Dead Sea Transform in red on the relocated seismicity map here is located at the edge of the network. Now, the most recent study aiming at retrieving 3D seismic velocities from travel time data was done by Kolakov and Sobolev back in 2006. They observed a clear low velocity signature <clears throat> of uh, the DST in the upper crust, which contrasts with structures in the lower crust and the upper mantle. On top of this, they also produced a Moho depth map of the area where very large variations can be seen with very thin uh, oceanic crust along the coast and a much thicker crust east of the fault. So because of such observations, we believe that the 3D representation of seismic velocities would reduce event location errors in the area. Such a 3D model would enable us to obtain a homogeneous set of event locations with reduced uncertainties notably by taking into consideration strong local effects, such as more depth variations, as mentioned, but also the drastic changes in local topography. A new high-resolution 3D velocity model for the area is of high interest to the city BTO, since the global model used to relocate events only has a few sampling nodes in the area. The local earthquake early warning system which for now uses a simple 1D model, could also take advantage of that 3D velocity model. In this case, either the 3D model or a set of 1D models designed for each tectonic area could be used. The Israeli seismic bulletin, where event locations and seismic data are published, is produced by the seismological division of the Geophysical Institute of Israel. They are responsible for monitoring more than 200 stations in the area, including more than 20 instruments from the historical Israeli seismic network, more than 100 accelerometers upgraded or replaced during the recent deployment along the Dead Sea Fault for the Israeli warning system, also two stations from the CTBTO's international monitoring system, and six from the Israeli national data centers cooperating national facilities. They also collect and publish data from neighboring countries. And although bulletins are available online for the recent few years only, the division has archived 
seismic bulletins since the beginning of the 80s. These archives also include regional and teleseismic events, and they also stored unpublished bulletins for mine-made seismicity, mainly calibration explosions and quarry blasts. Now, because of the reasons listed in introduction, some revision of the Israeli bulletin was needed. First of all, we identified station-specific inconsistencies in the bulletins and searched international databases for correct station locations when needed. We mainly used the station catalogs of the agencies listed here on the right. Secondly, we jointly relocated carefully selected seismic events, both natural and man-made. We took advantage of the known location of calibration explosions and used them as references. We relocated this catalog using the local 1D velocity model used by the division to produce the bulletin. The new set of event locations is shown in these two maps here on the right one for earthquakes and one for explosions, and all events are uh, colored according to depth, apart from calibration explosions that are shown as magenta squares. As shown in red at the bottom, we ended up with approximately 30,000 events, of which around 85% are explosions. We finally built a revised travel time database that includes the new coherent and accurate event locations, sets of phase station and event statistics that can be used to estimate uncertainties, correct phase levels, or apply travel time corrections, as well as the original bulletin arrivals. The figure on the right here shows the resulting revised travel time data set with respect to the new set of origin times and where each color represents a given seismic phase as listed on the top left corner. And black circles highlight corrected phase labels. From the numbers in the corner, you can see that the revised data set includes more than a half a million arrivals and 70% uh, of which are P arrivals. Now to invert this revised data set, for seismic velocities, we first used fast matching topography package developed by Nick Rawlinson. This approach uses a multi-stage fast matching method for the forward modeling, which is illustrated in the cartoon at the top. Each uh, step corresponding to a path section uh, between two interfaces. This method allows different types of seismic data for example, either passive or active, as well as different types of seismic sources, for example, either local or teleseismic. This is also illustrated in the cartoon where path one to five are local and path six is teleseismic. The model parameterization also allows a lot of uh, flexibility. allowing the integration of known structures like a dipping slab in the example shown at the bottom. Finally, the starting model can either be 1D or 3D. In our specific case, we designed a two-layer model separated by the MOHO with a um, horizontal spacing of 0 0.1 degrees and a radial spacing of five kilometers. And so here are the results from the most recent inversion test. In this case, we use the local 1D velocity model mentioned before as the starting model and estimated peak uncertainties from the relocation statistical reports. Now, the first striking observation in these maps are these large amplitude anomalies observed underneath most seismic stations at shallow depth. And while actually trying to determine their origin, a basic synthetic test provided unsatisfactory results. And so we decided to stop testing a different software. As a result, we recently started running inversions using the local earthquake tomography software developed by Ivan Kulakov, who used it to produce the velocity model shown in the introduction. And compared to FM Tomo, Lotus 
uses the ray bending method for the forward modeling, of which a few steps are illustrated here on the right. The package also enables the inversion for both P and S wave velocities. Furthermore, the grid's parameterization is fully based on ray density, and each run actually consists of several inversions where the initial grid orientation is rotated and the resulting velocity models are averaged in order to reduce any artifacts. Uh, finally, optimization of the starting model can also be performed while inverting for 3D structure. But so why we only started using LOTOS recently and didn't have time to perform a complete test Ivan Kulakov gracefully accepted to help us set an initial run, which are the results shown here. While the observed structures are generally more spatially coherent, we still observe large anomalies underneath most stations, but a deeper investigation of the code's workings is needed before any clear conclusions can be drawn. This logically brings us to the first conclusion, more work is needed to finalize the inversion for seismic velocity. Once this is done, the full description of our approach will be provided in a peer-reviewed article and all necessary model files will be made available online. After the model is final, the next step will be to read a catalog of events in order to demonstrate that the 3D velocity model does reduce location and uncertainties. This new event catalog can be used to improve seismic risk maps, and the 3D model can be included in the procedure of the Israeli uh, earthquake warning system. The final step will be to integrate the crustal model of Israel into the global model used for event relocation in the CTBTOs framework. This model and the software used to build it, the regional seismic travel time package, will uh, require an upgrade in order to allow for a resolution higher than one degree before we can integrate our model. Uh, finally, we are currently compiling local 1D models for each major tectonic unit, unit in the area in order to have slightly more accurate starting velocities in the tomographic inversion. That will be all. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very interesting research, and it's very useful also to understand the various structure and also contribute to the regional tomography and RSTP as well. Do we have any questions now? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I may ask one question. How do you use earthquake early warning system data? and how it contributed for your this research. Hi, I'm Yochaim. I will answer in the name of uh, Louis. Uh, mainly, we are not yet using the data of uh, the early warning system. It was only lately, not too far that it was installed and it's starting to operate. Uh, we have something like uh, 120 stations, and I assume that uh, this model can help us to make the early warning program more than to use the data. The data that we accumulate will be used in a few years from now, but uh, an accurate model will help us to uh, give a better alert and a more reliable alert, which is the most important thing. You don't want to alert, and it's not only to us, it's mainly the geophysical, the, it's the geological institute today, which are responsible for that. We hope to contribute to that. I'm sure it will contribute at least for the, the triggering the event and the, also issuing the messages for early warning. Thank you very much for the present, nice presentation. And have a good afternoon.
The next presentation is 3D dynamic earthquake rupture simulation in the Sea of Marmara. Yasemin Korkusuz Öztürk, Ali Özgün Konca, and myself also included. Yes, please, Yasemin, floor is yours. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about my PhD research study, which is based on 3D dynamic earthquake rupture simulations in the Sea of Marmara, which is prone to a large earthquake. The main Marmara Fault, that's the western portion of the right lateral structure with North Anatolian fault zone, has a right lateral structure with motion as well. On the other hand, there are extensional basins in the Sea of Marmara, as we can see those three basins clearly. On the map, we see the used fault trace for the main Marmara Fault and segment labels. The main goal of this study is to identify possible rupture initiation points, effects of heterogeneous stress load, effects of partially creeping areas and non-planar fault geometry, possible magnitude levels, rupture velocities, slip, slip rate and traction distributions on the fault, and displacement and velocity distributions on the ground surface. To generate realistic earthquake scenarios using physics-based approach, we consider past earthquakes to be placed on different fault segments from geodesy, 3D fault geometry, and heterogeneity of interseismic coupling from seismicity and geodesy. If we have a look at previous works, a dynamic earthquake rupture study in the Sea of Marmara is done by Ogles B and May by using a 3D finite element model and assuming a homogeneous stress state. They use rectangular grids for the 180 km long main Marmara fault and dipping angle is 90 degree for all segments except for the Princess Island segment, which has a 70 degree dipping angle. Also, in order to challenge with the regional uniform stress fields, they make stress rotations up to 20 degree, and they observe very large differences due to initial stress rotations. In terms of the results, best time initiation of rupture is the worst case, and rupture doesn't enter into the Princess Island segments for eastern initiations, and super shear rupture is possible. Our channel reach also assumed a homogeneous stress state in their uh, boundary integral equation model. They model a 100 kilometer portion of the eastern section of the main Marmara fault by using rectangular mesh. And they find that rupture, rupture doesn't enter into the Princess Island segment in any case. And Western initiation of rupture is the worst case and super shear rupture is possible again. If we summarize the motivation of our study, here we adapt heterogeneous shear stress distribution, considering historical earthquake records, slip rates from geodetic data, and coupling on the faults from repeating earthquake and strain meter studies. And also we adapt regional normal stress, considering recent stress sensor inversion studies. And we use a seismogenic zone up to 13 km depth, which is more realistic. And we make a better smoothing at fault bands, considering triangular mesh. And we assume that stress is totally released during the last large earthquake, and Kumbugat Basin segment has not been ruptured for the longest time. Here we see the seismic activity of the Marmara region between 2006 and 14, and some earthquake clusters are visible on the main Marmara fault. And when we look at the Eastern Ganos offshore region, this region is seismically active up to 15 km depth. When we look at the Western High, namely the Eastern Tekirdağ Basin region, it's seismically very active between 10 and 15 km depths, but it's relatively active above 10 km depth. So most probably this region is partially creeping above 10 km. When we look at the Eastern Central Marmara Basin cluster, Almost there is no earthquake above 10 km, but the region is relatively active below 10 and 14 km depth. And most probably this region is partially creeping around 50% above 10 km depth. If we look at the eastern Chunarjuk Basin region, this region is totally locked above 7 or 10 km depth, but it's seismically very active below this level. Here we would like to know when segments of the main Marmara fault last ruptured. So we merge historical earthquake catalog data for the possible epicenters of the earthquakes, and we merge turbidity records to identify possible rupture extensions of historical earthquakes. And what are turbidity records? When a large earthquake occurs, sediments flow to the basin. 
So by taking core samples, scientists can observe existence of layers for each earthquake up to around 2000 years. And if a turbidity record exists in the core sample, it means that the region is ruptured during the related event. But if no turbidity record is observed, we cannot become sure if the region ruptured or not. As a result of combination of those historical data and turbidity records, we plot the shown map. And Western Marmara is ruptured up to the end of Western High segment. Central Marmara Basin is a question mark, so we assume that it was ruptured during the second 1766 earthquake, and the Eastern Marmara may be last ruptured during 1766 or 1894 earthquakes. So for the Eastern Marmara, we consider both cases. After calculating the time passed since last large earthquake for each cluster, we combine recent geodetical studies in order to calculate slip rates on the fault. Here we show some figures from geodetic studies that we combine their results. For example, for the first study, they suggest around 9 km locking depth for the Western Marmara with around 20 mm per year slip rate. For the Central Marmara, they obtain around 2 mm per year slip rate, which supports grip of this region. And for the Eastern Marmara, around 10 and 14 mm slip rates observed and a shallow overlocking that seems to be possible. For, for normal tractions, we select the most useful maximum principal stress axis orientations from recent local studies. Those are highlighted on the table, and we assume that the normal stress is regional. So for the calculation of normal tractions, we start from Cumbergas Basin segment, as we assume that that's totally locked and using shear traction at, seg at that segment, we, the static friction coefficients, we calculate normal traction of this region. Then considering the strike angle of the Cumbergas Basin segment, we calculate the regional normal traction. Finally, using this normal traction value, we can calculate normal traction components for each segment. An, an example is shown on the right for the segment A, which is for Ganos uh, offshore region. And if we look at our input geometry, our geometry is quite similar with the geometry of Ogles B and May. And the only difference is that we remove 2.4 kilometer segment for simplicity. Since we are using a finite element based numerical technique, we have to model the whole 3D medium and put absorbing boundaries at the fault edge. And we make tetragonal mesh with a gradient, namely we use 200 meter grid size on the fault surface, but the grid size is increasing with the distance from the fault. Here on the top, we see our fault model, and the fault width is 15 km, and we define three different possible rupture initiation points, and points of the, in the Kumburgas basin are at 10 km depth, and points in the Princess Island segment is at 7.5 km depth. And in the dynamic simulations, we define a fault geometry, which has a slip weakening friction law and the initial stress distribution. And by initiating a point, we start the rupture and we observe distribution of stress. In the bottom fault figure, we show locking depth information for each segment with the assumption of full stress release during last large earthquake on this segment. And we assume that Ganos region Ganos region, Kumburgas region, Princess Island segment, and Izmit segments are totally locked as a result of current seismicity studies. Here we don't know the actual creep amounts at the Western High and Central Marmara Basin clusters. So we adapt these partially locked patches by embedding locked lock layers at different depths and sometimes generating homogeneously or heterogeneously distributed small patches. From this point of my talk, I will try to give you our results. Due to we have 18 main scenarios, we will show only a small number of them. Here, final slip distributions in the along strike direction are shown for fully locked models for the selected initiation points. We do not present a model for the Princess Island initiation for 1894 rupture, because rupture doesn't initiate for this case. When we compare results for 1766 and 1894 ruptures, it's visible that rupture doesn't enter into the Princess Island segment for 1894 rupture. A maximum slip amount are observed at Central Marmara Basin and Kumburgas Basin segments. And the magnitude of the expected earthquake can be around 7.2 for a fully locked model. 
a maximum slip amount is changing between 4.9 and 5.5 meters. Also, the largest rupture velocity is calculated as 2.7 km per second. If you look at some examples of results of the rupture initiation at the center of the Kumbur-Gaz Basin segment for 1766 rupture case, we observe 5 mm maximum slip at Kumbur-Gaz Basin and Princess Island segment for the first four cases, and 4.9 meter for the last case. And the difference of the last case is that central Marmara Basin segment has complex partially creeping case. And in addition, slip around the partially creeping segments is around 1.5 meter. And the only difference of this slide with the previous one is that the rupture is initiated at the eastern boundary of the Kumbugas Basin segment. And maximum slip in the along strike direction is obtained around 5 meter. When we look at results for the Princess Island segment initiation, the maximum along strike slip can increase up to 5.1 meter. If I conclude my presentation, it's the first time that we constrain the regional normal stress with recently derived local principal stress axis orientations and shear stress with, with recent geodetic data and historical earthquake activity. And if Princess Island was ruptured at 1766, the mean Marmara fault earthquake may initiate at Kumbugaz Basin or Princess Island segments. If it was ruptured at 1894, the earthquake may not start at Princess Island segments. And if it last ruptured at 1894, the fracture most probably may not propagate to east. And rupture doesn't enter into the Izmit segment in any case, as it's already ruptured during 1999 Izmit earthquake. And if it's and it's most probable that the rupture can initiate at Kumburgaz Basin segment due to higher strength excess need of the Princess Island initiation. And sub shear rupture velocities are obtained for all 80 scenarios. Shallow locking depth and heterogeneous coupling may be the reason for smaller magnitudes and lower rupture velocities. Possible maximum slip amounts are changing between 4.7 meter and 5.1 meter, and possible moment magnitudes are changing between 6.9 and 7.3. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Yasemin. It was not easy to make an approach for dynamic rupture simulation. As we all know, do we have any questions mm -hmm. now? I would like to ask you, what is the stability condition number of your simulation? If you talk a bit about how we evaluate it. And also the, your uh, grid size, if you check the other works, other research works, uh, grid size, if you compare with the, your study that you used. Thank you. The current predictive yeah. yeah. stability yeah. condition yeah. number of our study. Do you hear? Sorry? Yes. Do you hear me? The current predictive stability you. condition number, no, the condition number of our study is 0 0.175. And if this number is equal or less than 0 0.2, it means that the numerical uh, simulation can give the best results. So uh, our number is less than 0 0.2, it means that our simulations are very stable. And also, and this stability, stability number is uh, depending on the grid size and the time step. Our time step is one second, which is already very small. And this is uh, 200 meters. Uh, therefore, the condition number is very good, and uh, we can say that our results are stable. And also, if I compare the grid size with the previous studies, uh, we, we use 200 meter grid size in our study, but in the previous uh, works, they used 400 and 500 meter grid size, and they verified the results with 200 meters. But we verified our results with 100 meter grid size. Therefore, our results are more sensitive. And also, we use triangular mesh, uh, although they use rectangular mesh. This uh, mesh type of uh, better smoothing at the fault, um, fault edge. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Yasemin, for this good talk. And yeah.
makes one move it. What is the We will continue with the, uh, the next two presentations. Um, I just want to remind everyone that um, you can post your questions in the the chat on the uh, Super Event uh, app. So please do not hesitate if you if you have any questions. The um, the next presentation is on the teleseismic depth determination techniques and uncertainties and. A Malayan case study. This is by Marine Laporte, Locke, Bejaya, Adikari, Ioan Kanu, Jean Latorte, and Lauren Bollinger. Um, this is uh, pre recorded, so let's, let's proceed, please. Hello, thank you for receiving me today. My name is Marine Laporte, and I am a second year PhD student at CIE in France in seismology and seismotechnics. Today, I'm going to present you a part of my thesis work on the analysis of depth determination techniques using global teleseismic networks. During my thesis, I'm working at both regional and teleseismic distance, confronting several earthquake locations techniques in order to quantify more precisely the hypocentral depth uncertainties associated to each of them. Depth is a crucial parameter in seismotectonic studies, since an accurate depth determination allows to confront the location of seismic clusters with the full geometry, as you can see on the cross-section. On the other hand, in forensic seismology, a quick depth determination is a valuable input for the discrimination between earthquakes and explosions. Working at teleseismic distance has the advantage to not be dependent on regional seismological stations in areas with very few stations installed or areas with low accessibility. In those cases, the depth determination relies on the time delay between the arrival of the direct wave and the secondary arrivals of depth phases, little p big P and little s big P, which are reflections of the P and S waves at the earth surface. Both secondary waves are detectable between 3,000 and 10,000 kilometers, and the time delay between the direct wave and its echoes is primarily controlled by the source depth and the crystal velocity model above the source. The main challenge of teleseismic depth determination techniques using time delays is to improve the detection of echoes in the teleseismic signals. Among those te techniques, Kepström analysis has been discovered in the 60s as a useful tool for echo detection. It consists to retrieve the primary and secondary modulations in a seismic signal by taking twice the Fourier transform. First, in order to get the signal spectrum. Secondly, on the logarithm of the spectrum for mathematical comfort uh, to get the Kepström. Thus, it is possible to retrieve the source stem corresponding to the direct wave with a simple subtraction. An automatic method of Kepström analysis has been introduced by Jean Le Thor in 2014. I will confront this automatic method with a manual method I've been currently developing. This method is based on manual picking of depth from sums of Hilbert envelopes, and it relies on the depth migration of all teleseismic signals. 
since the PP wave arrives before the SP wave at every teleseismic station, the resulting depth should correspond to the first echo in the PP case, which is the blue sum of envelope in the central figure, and the second peak in the SP case, which is the red sum of envelopes in the same figure. As a combination of both observations, the final depth should be constrained by those two coherent peaks. In this presentation, I will only confront those two methods, even if depth determination at teleseismic distance can also be achieved through waveform inversions or some other techniques based as well on time delays, signal transformation, or staking of seismological arrays. Then, working at teleseismic distance allows us to choose any worldwide dataset as we want. For reaching our objectives, we selected two regions which have been both previously studied from a regional standpoint. Then, we will compare regional and teleseismic depth estimates. The first objective is to validate the Capstrom on Hilbert envelopes in an area with a large number of events above magnitude 4 on a wide range of depth. We chose northern Chile, with a seismicity occurring between 50 and 300 kilometers, which have been localized by two recent studies at regional on teleseismic distance. Our second objective is to reach the limits of teleseismic methods for shallow events with smaller magnitudes, because it becomes more difficult to highlight the echoes when they arrive closely after the direct wave. For discrimination purposes, we expect those methods to be efficient even for shallow earthquakes. In the case of Chile, 10,000 events have been located by another team at regional distance. Here, I present a comparison between Hilbert depth in grey and capstone depth colored as a function of topography with the regional depth for approximately 100 events. I also compared the results using only stations from the IMS on the left and stations from all open seismological networks on the right. Some of the data dispersion can be explained by vertical errors which have been quantified on regional data, as you can see on the maps on the right. Those errors are about 4 km for, for shallow events and 10 km for deeper ones. We also added errors from the topography, which is not taken into account yet in teleseismic methods. Here we see that for stacking techniques such as Hilbert and Capstrom, accuracy becomes greater with the number of observations. However, we get quicker results by using the international monitoring system. Teleseismic signals can also be used for seismotectonic studies. In Chile, lateral variations of geometry of the slab have been evidenced by looking at the projections of the seismicity along the cross-section AB. The seismicity is represented in white on the right figure. We succeeded to recover the Chilean slab geometry by using teleseismic signals from only two IMS stations and by summing all the envelopes of projected events on the track. Then we produce an image of the energetic content of all envelopes on the track. As you can see, we highlight the same lateral vari variations as we could see in the seismicity. Our second case study is Nepal, where seismicity is monitored for 20 years by the National Earthquake Monitoring Center of Kathmandu. As you can see on the geological cross-section on the right, the region presents a seismicity located at mid-crystal depths and collocated with the main Himalayan thrust fault in red, which is the main tectonic structure responsible of great earthquake ruptures in the past. We will focus on two Nepalese regions. First, far western Nepal, where the micro seismicity has been recently relocated with a temporary seismological network. For improving the depth resolution and for which we know the main regional uncertainties. Secondly, I will present pre preliminary results for, of a collaborative work between institutes on the recent Tanjung seismic crisis in central Nepal. In far western Nepal, the iConnect temporary experiment has been deployed for two years and provided high-quality locations of more than 2,000 earthquakes. 
Among them, 48 events were recorded at teletechnic distance and 17 were considered as high quality regarding geometrical criteria. We were able to find manually teleseismic depth estimations within 5 km of local depth, determined at regional distance for most of its events. Even though, as you can see on the central figure, the identification of depth phases for such shallower events is not as straightforward as for deeper ones. As a last example, here are the pre preliminary results on a seismic crisis that occurred last month in central Nepal. It is a collaborative work between France and Nepal. The crisis has been located a few kilometers away from the left termination of the 2015 Gorka earthquake and began on the 18th of May with a main shock of local magnitude 5.5. The main shock was followed by 100 events in the five days. Using regional data from all Nepali stations, we located the cluster with absolute and relative locations using IPO71 and IPODD algorithms. In both cases, the cluster occurs at depth between 8 to 14 kilometers. However, the main shock is not located at the same depth with 10 kilometers for IPO71 and 14 kilometers for IPODD. Then we studied the depth of the main shock using some other regional anti-seismic techniques. We performed a regional moment tensor inversion in order to retrieve the focal mechanism associated to the main shock. This inversion outlines a preferred depth between 17 km and 25 km regarding three distinct velocity models. We also performed the Kepstrom analysis for, that automatically gave us a depth of 17 km which is close to the 14 kilometers of IPODD locations, considering the topography above the source, which rise from 800 meters in the valley to 3,500 meters at the top. The manual method of Hilbert and Blobs presents as well numerous, numerous coherent peaks at 14 kilometers, 17 kilometers, and 25, that may be influenced by azimuthal biases for seismic stations receiving reflections at distinct topography. This particular crisis is interesting for understanding sources of depth error in distinct earthquake location techniques. The difficulty of identifying depth phase may arise from velocity model discrepancy above the source, since the event is close to a main geological structure filled with fluids, and mainly from the complexity of the topography above the source. Further study should help us quantify errors related to the velocity model and the topography. As a conclusion, in this presentation, I mainly confronted two teleseismic depth determination techniques, an automatic capstrom analysis, and a new manual method using Hilbert and Blobs of teleseismic signals. We propose to confront this teleseismic depth with regional seismic catalogs of well-constrained depth in order to point out errors in depth results at teleseismic distance. We also show that it is possible to use teleseismic signals for highlighting lateral variations in the geometry of large tectonic structures. In this presentation, we presented two case studies, Chile and Nepal, for validation of teleseismic methods and for reaching the limits of teleseismic depth methods for shallow earthquakes in complex tectonic environments. In the future, uh, we will pursue this kind of comparisons between regional and teleseismic depth. The objective is to quantify depth uncertainties for teleseismic methods. This is the, the end of the presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marie. Um, we have a minute or so still open for, for questions to, to Marie. Let, let me maybe just um, a quick question. I perhaps did not entirely catch when you said to establish the uncertainty in, in the depth for this approach that you have. In, in the work that you've done so far, what is the just a ballpark figure. What is the uncertainty you think that you typically work with and what does it depend on? Is, is there anything beyond the velocity structure? 
uh, for now, I haven't uh, done a lot of tests uh, for finding uh, quantifying uncertainties for teleseismic methods, but we think it uh, resides um, mainly uh, in the um, topography that we don't take into account. And in Nepal, it's quite difficult because there is large uh, variations of topography uh, above the so source of those events. But mainly, it could be due to uh, errors in velocity models uh, that uh, we, we need to do more tests. Thank, thank, thank you. I think it's it's very interesting, and uh, good luck with uh, your uh, your future work on this. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Our last presentation for today is on the P wave arrival time demography of the Middle East. The authors are Manawatushi, Susini De Silva, Renjan Gok, Ebru Bostek, Gust Nulay, Ahmed Ali, and Yaya Tarabulsi. And uh, this will be presented by Ebru Bostak. Is it, Ebru, you will um, share your, your slides with us? Okay, we'll do it. We'll do it from this side. No, no need. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> so, so you can just prompt us to uh, to change the slides. Okay. I think it's in. The, it's already recorded. Good. Thank you. Hello, I'm Abu Bozdar from Colorado School of Mines, and I will present our efforts to construct a P-Way model for the Middle East and the surrounding region using the ISC catalog as well as the P-Way arrival times from waveform data from the Arabian Peninsula. The Middle East is marked by different types of trade boundaries. Oceanic rifts along the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden on the west and southwest. Continental collusion along the Bitlis Zagros true zone in Anatolia and Iran due to the northward movement of the Arabian plate. The relative motion of the Arabian plate with respect to the African plate also facilitates the Dead Sea transform fault on the west and the west on the west, and the westward escape of the Anatolian plate using the north and east Anatolian strike slip faults, together with the subduction along the Hellenic and Cyprus arcs in the Mediterranean. Shortening due to the continental collusion is accommodated by a combination of crustal thickening in Iran and lateral extrusion in Turkey. The Red Sea splits the Nubian and the Arabian shields, where the rest of the Arabian Peninsula is mainly dominated by the Arabian platform. In the eastern Anatolia and on the west of the Arabian Peninsula, a series of volcanoes are also observed. The area is rapidly deforming and highly prone to destructive earthquakes, specifically in Iran and Anatolia, and together with the availability of dense seismic networks and new data, we have new opportunities to refine the seismic structure of the region. There are many tomographic studies conducted in this interesting region using body waves and surface waves as well as noise data. Here you see only some examples from P and S wave arrival time tomographic models similar to our study, where data from IC catalog together with arrival time readings from some waveform data were used to improve the data coverage. The models overall show consistent features with the dynamics of the region, such as subduction along the Hellenic arc, correlation of low wave speeds with the volcanic regions on the western Arabian Peninsula, plume-like features in the Afar region, low velocities in the, at the Red Sea, under-trusting of the Arabian plate underneath the Eurasian plate, etc. In general, seismic models at long wavelengths are in agreement with each other, regardless of data type and inversion strategy where one of the main limitations is the sparse data cover coverage in the region when we would like to improve the resolution. The seismicity and the seismic stations are not evenly distributed in the region. On the left-hand side, you see the distribution of earthquakes in the region from the global CMT catalog, larger than moment magnitude of 5.5, which mainly follow the plate boundaries and major fault zones. 
The red, sea, uh, the red and blue beach balls show the events deeper and shallower than 50 kilometers uh, respectively. Notice the gap in seismicity in the Arabian Peninsula. The right hand side figure shows the distribution of broadband seismic stations in the region. The blue stations, as well as the red ones in Anatolia, denote permanent and temporary arrays whose data are mainly accessible from IRIS. In addition, there are dense local seismic networks from Kandili Observatory and Alphat in Anatolia, which are not shown here, whose waveform data are also freely available. Green and most of the red stations in the Arabian Peninsula and Iran are from local networks, which are not publicly available. The source receiver distribution in the region highlights the importance of the stations in the Arabian Peninsula and Iran to improve the resolution of the crossland mantle structure of the region. One way to improve data coverage in the region could be to combine different data sets, which has been the main motivation for us in this project. Indeed, arrival time readings from the ISC catalog can be complementary to the waveform data. Here on the left-hand side, you see P and S wave readings from the catalog until 2015, which may be used to improve the data coverage in the region. In this study, our goal is to construct a new P wave model of the region using the data from the ISC catalog. To improve the coverage, we also assimilate P arrival time readings from the green stations in the Arabian Peninsula operated by the Saudi Geological Survey. Our ultimate goal is to perform a full waveform inversion of the region using all available and accessible waveforms, waveform data, where we will demonstrate assimilating ISC data in our inversions. We start by gathering P wave arrival times from the ISC EHB catalog by Engdahl et al which has improved hypocentral location accuracy, careful phase and event selections. We first collected P onset times from 1990 to 2016 events reported in the International Seismological Center ISC bulletin that are reinterpreted with smaller location uncertainties and are corrected for phase mislabeling. We ensure that data set uses arrival peaks in the full magnitude range of from 0 to 9, but we use only events that are picked with a high confidence level. We select events with at least 50 P wave peaks recorded worldwide, windowing out events with unreliable P onset peaks due to the reasons such as low energy in the arrival or the complexity of the source time function. We also ensure that no two selected events are closer than 20 km apart to limit cluttering of ray paths from events located in highly seismically active regions. In addition to above criteria, we, in addition, we select peaks listed with at least two decimal precision, selecting 303,000 P peaks recorded by a total of 11 in the Middle East. Central distribution of the selected events along with a representation of how many P arrival peaks we have for each of those events is shown on the top figure, while the left bottom map illustrates how many peaks were collected from each local station. On the left, great circle paths for the selected event station pairs are shown, where different colors denote 62 different event clusters. This figure shows the heat count maps computed for 2 by 2 degree cells at various depth sections, showing the coverage we have with the ISC data. As seen from the maps, the best coverage is underneath Anatolia because of the dense seismic network why the coverage is becoming sparse in the Arabian Peninsula. The coverage gets better below about 150 kilometers 
where the upper mantle is reasonably well sampled with the ISC data. We intend to cover the missing ray coverage on the northern Arabian Peninsula and upper portions of the Iranian plateau by using a more recent and well-located ISC data set and by adding P arrival times measured from waveforms collected within the Saudi Arabia. On the right-hand side, you see our carefully selected arrival time data from the ISC catalog to fill the gap in the Arabian Peninsula via assimilated arrival times of first arrival P waves for a set of selected earthquakes denoted by red stars on the left map, recorded by seismic stations denoted by blue triangles. Here you see sample P wave arrival time peaks for a sample event recorded by seven stations in the region. The red triangles denote the manually picked onset times, where the estimated P wave arrival times for the radially symmetric model AK135 are also marked for reference. The waveforms are bandpass filtered between 0.5 to 2 Hz to be able to see the onset times better. In this slide, we present our checkerboard test results for 2.4 by 2.4 degree cells at various depths with ISC data only and after we assimilate arrival time readings from regional waveforms recorded by the stations in the Arabian Peninsula. Since we use waveforms from only regional events, the additional data mainly help improving the upper mantle. This, we specifically observe the improvements down to about 250 kilometers. Since the ISC coverage is already good enough below 300 kilometers, at 400 and 700 kilometer sections, the effect is not significantly pronounced. The test suggests that we have good sampling down to at least 1,000 kilometers. Here we present some cross-sections of P-wave perturbations from our model at 68 and 135 kilometers with associated checkerboard tests of 2.4 by 2.4 and 4 by 4 degree resolution. Clear low velocities on the west of the Arabian Peninsula and western Anatolia are observed. Eastern Anatolia are observed, which are associated with the volcanic regions. Similar features were also observed in previous studies, for instance, well, there is a well correlation, there is a good correlation with the S-wave model of Chang'an Fandali at similar depths where we observe faster P-wave speeds in Western Anatolia, unlike slower S-waves reported in their model. Another interesting observation in our model is the clear separation of the Arabian Shield and the Arabian platform in the upper mantle with low and high P-wave speeds respectively which is best observed around 135 and 226 kilometer sections. In this slide, we present some vertical sections across the Arabian Peninsula towards the Iranian plateau in the southwest northeast direction. There's a significant velocity increase observed where the sections crosses the bitlis Zagros Stur zone the under-trusted Arabian plate due to the collusion of the Arabian plate with the Eur Eurasian plate is clearly observed with high wave speeds. The change in the thrust pattern from north to south is as observed in the figures where the dipping fast anomalies become flattened as we go towards south. The cross sections across the Hellenic and Cyprus arcs also clearly show the subducted slabs the subducted slab along the Hellenic arc is observed penetrating to the lower mantle towards the, as we go towards east. The slab underneath the Cyprus arc is shallower and seems to be detached below, below 200 kilometers, as shown in sections JJ prime and KK prime. In conclusion, we attempted to improve the resolution in the Middle East by combining ISC arrival times with those picked from the waveform data collected from the Arabian Peninsula. Our model is consistent with previous studies on major features, such as low wave speed anomalies in volcanic and plume regions, 
while depicting the underthrust subduction, subduction features along the Bitlis Sagros collusion. Our P wave model also highlights the separation of the Arabian shield and the Arabian platform in the upper mantle. In the next step, our goal is to perform full waveform inversion by incorporating the ISC data. This research is supported by the U.S. Air Force National Laboratory. We gratefully acknowledge the support of the U.S. Air Force National Labs Laboratory and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ibru, and my uh, apologies. I misunderstood initially that this was a live presentation, but uh, very interesting. And um, we're reaching the end of the uh, the session, I just wanted to, to check on something with you. There was a moment where the sound disappeared a bit. Uh, when you talked about your data, did you mention 303,000 events in total that you considered for this demography? Um, I think it's 300,000 peaks about. Peaks, uh, okay. Because uh, after the data was cleaned uh, and after the quality checks, yeah. Um, millions of ISC data was reduced to about 300,000. 300,000. Thank you. I'm checking for the last time if there's any other questions. Not then, unfortunately, I have to say we've come to the end of, um, uh, of this session. There will very soon be another session in this room. I thank the five presenters today and everyone that made time to be uh, in, in this um, uh, in this session, thank you very much, and um, please continue to follow the sessions for the rest of the week uh, that uh, you have an interest in, and um, please use the the chat feature for any questions that you may have. And of course, for this session as well, if you did not get to ask the questions that you would have liked to ask, then. Um, the chat stays active. You can also communicate directly with the with with the authors, with the presenters, and uh, please use the opportunity. Thank you very much. From our side, that is uh, the end of our session.